I'm Yasmina Zaidman. I'm the Chief uh, Partnership and Development Officer for Acumen. And we are joined today um, by entrepreneur Ben, as well as two investors, to talk about work that we've done together um, that I'll give a little bit of context for. But just to kind of briefly introduce the panel, to my right, Lisa Willems, who's the president and founder of Alpha Mundi Foundation, um, and really was the kind of instigator of the, the G-Search Coalition that we'll talk more about. Ben Prinz, who is the founder and CEO of, get the name wrong, a silly, change, a silly agriculture, um, who was a part of this research, and Willie Foote, who's the CEO and founder of Root Capital, um, who also participated. So we've all had a chance to work pretty closely together um, and hopefully can share with you some of our experiences. So the premise for the conversation today is that for a lot of us, gender equity, uh, and I think probably for many of you as well, is not just kind of the right thing to do, but is really the smart thing to do for building high impact um, and successful businesses. And you know, whether it's intuitive or justice-based or evidence-based, there is actually a strong case that advancing gender equity in business overall is just the smarter path. Um, we've seen data that shows that female-led companies outperform all male founding teams, um, we've seen the benefits that accrue from having uh, gender diverse boards um, across every kind of business. And there's actually a new study that came out from um, Arabesque that showed that gender diverse companies are more likely to align their strategy around a goal of capping global warming. So it seems like gender diversity could have multiple impacts. Um, but despite all of this evidence, the reality is that across large mainstream businesses and often among startups as well, it is really difficult to see the kind of gender parity and gender equity that we want to see. Um, not only in terms of the companies, but also the ways that they operate, the people they employ, and sometimes the customers that they serve. So we as a community of investors who really see the value of gender equity wanted to find a way to advance gender equity, not just by saying, let's just dedicate all of our capital to female entrepreneurs, but to dig deeper into this question of how do you integrate gender equity across your portfolio and really embed it in the DNA, particularly of early stage companies, rather than waiting until they've scaled to say, these are some sort of deeper problems that we see. How do we start from the beginning and integrate that into the ways that we support companies? So this is not a conversation about sort of portfolio construction or investment strategy. This is about how we support and accompany the companies that we work with. So we're gonna talk a lot about technical assistance and capacity building. What are we doing with the entrepreneurs that we support to advance gender equity? Um, we have provided some copies for you of an executive summary of the research that we decided to do. Uh, essentially, we had a conversation, and Lisa will talk more about it, but it was like, we're doing this, but what are we learning, and are we really leveraging each other as much as we could to understand what's working. And so we joined forces, um, Alpha Mundi, Acumen, and four other impact investors to look at specific TA projects that we could learn from and ended up looking at over 30 projects. Um, so today we'll hear a little bit about the research, but really want to open it up to a conversation with all of you to see how this issue comes up either for your business, for your fund, or if you're one of those organizations that's really helping to lay the, the groundwork for gender equity, where you've seen successes and challenges. Um, so I'm going to start with Lisa. And I would love for you to just share a little bit more about how this research came to be um, and some of the key takeaways um, that you guys came away with. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are like SOCAP veterans and have been around at this conference for a while, Suzanne Beagle always used to do a gender thing that you know started at like 7 or 8 AM like really early. And when she first started, there were like nine people in here. And by 2019, or I think that was when we, Yasmin and I talked, it was, you know, this massive tent with like two, 300 people. Um, so our journey, you know, started first by, just for background, Alpha Mundi invests predominantly debt, um, mezzanine financing, in early state enterprises in East Africa and Latin America. So most of the pipeline we were seeing uh, was male founders. And basically, a lot of this started because the earlier definitions, I think, of gender lens investing, we just felt were a little bit too narrow. So as Yasmina just mentioned, it's not just about directing capital to female founders, which, of course, we want to do and, and continue, want to encourage everyone to continue doing as well. But we were investing in companies that had 20 employees at the time of our investment and grew to seven, 800, 1,000 employees. And we wanted to come up with a way to embed gender equity, empower women in these companies, and you know, not ignore 
75% of the pipeline companies we were seeing. So how can we, you know, broaden this definition of, of gender lens investing to include all these companies that might not be started by women, but have tremendous potential to impact the, you know, local employees, the staff, the clients, beneficiaries, et cetera. Um, so we started, uh, we, I founded Alpha Mindy Foundation in 2016 to raise uh, a dedicated technical assistance facility to support our companies. Uh, gender was one of the issues I really wanted to focus on. And we realized other people, Root Capital, were doing this, I think, probably longer than anybody else. Yasmin and I were chatting at SOCAP at this gender event three years ago. And we were like, how can we do more of this? How can we scale this? And I think what investors really want to see is a business case for it. So what are the concrete social and financial benefits of spending money on doing this type of work? And that was how this got started, because we were like, all right, we know a lot of people who are doing similar things, but no one's ever actually you know, researched what the quantitative benefits are that we can see. Like We know anecdotally from talking to our companies that they've seen benefits, um, but the purpose of G-Search was to actually take a subset of projects you know, from like-minded investors and p apply a very rigorous analytical approach. So we worked with the uh, uh, William Davidson Institute at the University of Michigan and, you know, lots of, of survey data, pre and post project, pre and post intervention. Um, and the result is really two years of, of this research report that you can find here, which is really just scratching the surface, but does show that we uncovered a lot of very concrete social and financial benefits of, of this type of work. Um, and maybe I stop there for now. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll have lots, lots more to explore. So I'm gonna hop over you for a second and come back to you. Um, so Willie, I guess, just as Lisa said, you've been doing this longer than anyone, and gender, I feel like, has been <laughs> in, in this group. Um, gender has been integral to your strategy for a really long time. And I wanted to just hear from you sort of why that's the case and how you think about supporting the entrepreneurs and the businesses that you work with uh, with that gender lens. Well, thanks, Yasmina. It's great to be here. So I guess I'd, I'd say our, our work is very much influenced by the kind of capital that we provide um, and the sector that we're in. And so um, agriculture, uh, root capital's clients are farmer cooperatives and farmer associations, uh, village-based processors and millers of, of, uh, of uh, local crops, and you know, purchase coffee, cocoa, tree nuts, local grains, other crops, and really can provide a springboard out of poverty for millions of people. And as you said, this, this year we are um, celebrating our 10th anniversary of our Women in Agriculture Initiative, whereby we've invested in uh, women-led, invested in and providing lots of business support to women-led and gender-inclusive businesses that are proactively creating economic opportunity for women and also increased opportunities for participation and leadership of women uh, at the enterprise level and also at the farmer level. And so when I think about, so actually this year we are um, roughly 25% of our portfolio is, is women-led and over 50% is, is gender uh, inclusive. And uh, so to, to how the capital, the root capital uh, provides influence of what we're doing, we are, uh, a lot of what we do, not all of what we do on the lending side is trade finance, is working capital, short-term working capital so far farmers get paid well and on time. Uh, when the when the harvest hits, this year we're going to provide roughly 170 million dollars to 200 businesses, roughly that aggregate about 750,000 farming families. So three million people, if you include uh, uh, family members, household members. Um, so there's uh, and we, we will train this year, financing 200 will train provide business support to about 350 businesses, half of whom are in our current portfolio, half of which are in a one to two year process of entering uh, into our portfolio. Why is that important in terms of how we, um, how we approach business support is that we have a lot of pattern recognition over the years, working with hundreds and hundreds of businesses as to what are those specific needs that we need to customize around capacity building, but they can be very repeatable and scalable across similar profiles of businesses really uh, around the world. And um, so, Specifically, I'll mention four key things where we focus on business support. First is uh, business management advisory, specifically financial fundamentals. So that would be uh, accounting systems, financial reporting, financial analysis, financial planning. It's pricing and profitability, internal controls, financial literacy at the farmer level. So that's thing one. Thing two would be um, data 
uh, DBI data business uh, intelligence, whereby we're digitizing farmer level data uh, across now close to 80 of our clients and building the enterprise level information management systems so that the data at the farmer level can be used as a decision making tool and can inform, for instance, and monitor and track climate smart agricultural practices, regenerative agricultural practices. And then last one would be, for instance, that I mentioned, there are others, but ACRA, which is Agronomic and Climate Resilience Advisory, where we're working with the local extension teams, uh, the agronomic teams within farmer businesses, to deepen their expertise around regenerative agricultural practices and build up those teams and provide um, all sorts of support there. So all of this we deliver, and I'll come to where gender equity fits in. All of this we deliver through centralized workshops and on-site advisory. So just quickly, where gender equity fits in on our business support, I'll just mention a few things. First, um, we've had a partnership since the very beginning with Value for Women, which is a gender research organization. It's been a very important partnership for us, whereby together we have developed and we've established and we've hardwired and we've disseminated kind of the fundamentals of gender inclusive training. Uh, and also rolled out our commitments uh, in gender equity across our global operations. So that's been really important. The next one is that we've trained and continue to train all of our advisors, uh, our business support uh, advisors around the world uh, in um, gender inclusive pedagogy that we've developed together with Value for Women. And so that's making sure that everybody's really up to speed on what our best practices, what our um, the gender dynamics that would really influence how you are, are very thoughtful about inclusion of women in the training. A uh, couple more, mainstreaming what we call a gender inclusive checklist, where we're trying to be, for instance, very thoughtful about location and timing of, say, a centralized workshop, whereby, for instance, we will make sure, and we've learned this the hard way over the years, that if we have a three day or four day um, centralized uh, workshop on cash flow projections in Goma in Eastern Congo. We make sure that we have a session in the morning, session in the afternoon, but there's a say a three hour session in the middle so that women, if they need to cook a meal for their family or they have personal responsibilities that they can't get away from, that they can do that. Um, and maybe, maybe lastly I'll mention incentivizing participation of women. So we will, for instance, ensure that we're paying for childcare so that women who come to a centralized workshop either can bring their children or bring their sister or their mother to help them out or um, line up childcare uh, alongside. So all these things, just to conclude, have allowed us to, and I think in the last couple of years, we've gone from 30% participation of women in our, in our workshops to 36 last year, which was 1,330 women who were participating in these workshops. And it's absolutely been fundamental for the work we're doing. We'll get into more, but that's the overview. Thank you, Roy. One thing I love about the, the last set of numbers that you gave, you know, going from 30 to 36%, it's not like, well, we're done now, we've solved this. It's that you're seeing the progress and you can learn what did you do that got you from 30 to 36 that might get you to 50. Yeah. And so that to me is at the basis of what we were trying to do here. It wasn't to make the perfect, the enemy, the good, but say, what are we doing that's working? Yeah. So I wanna to turn to you, Ben. Um, you're an entrepreneur, you're building your business. You're also an investee of Alpha Mundi. Um, and we're kind of the beneficiary, I guess, of one of these TA projects. So I want to hear a little bit about how you've worked with investors like Alpha Mundi to support your own efforts around gender equity and how that shows up in your business and kind of what, what was it like? What worked, what didn't work? If you think about the experience of really intentionally focusing on that gender equity piece of your business. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. And thanks for including me in this, uh, Yasmina and Lisa. Um, so let me just take a quick step back and introduce Asili. Asili Agriculture is an agri-service and marketplace platform operating in Uganda. Uh, we've been operating since 2013. Uh, we provide farm management services to both small-scale producers as well as uh, large-scale landowners who are looking to cultivate their land according to climate smart or regenerative uh, agriculture practices, primarily in the, in the staple foods value chain, so maize and, maize and soybean. And then we also have a platform through which we market uh, over 40,000 tons a year that we're sourcing from those small-scale producers um, and from, uh, from our enterprise producers or the large-scale landowners to, to customers across the region. Uh, World Food Program is accounting for about 20% of our, 
of our customers, uh, uh, large feed and animal animal feed and and, and food processors in, in Kenya and and in Uganda. Um, and so, uh, and we've been operating since 2013, working with about 15,000 smallholder farmers and providing intensive land management services on about 8,000 hectares, uh, and, and really pioneering conservation or regenerative agriculture practices in, in, in East Africa. Um, so we're, we're an, an investee of, of Alpha Mundi, and uh, I just want to take a step back again and just share that when we, when we started the business, my brother and I co-founded the business together. Um, both being in Uganda, I think we, I would say we, we kind of had a, the gender equity was a little bit opportunistic for us in the sense that we just found that the best senior management that we could find were women. Um, and so at a very early stage from the company, you know, we had a, at, this, at the senior level of the company, a very high lopsided towards, uh, you know, our, our local staff being, being, being women. But as we grew and you know, grew to where we employ right now about 250 full-time employees and about 900 temporary temporary employees across our operation. That I, I think you know intentional or that ethos that we had in the beginning uh, quite quickly slept, uh, slipped and 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 really never evolved into like a core strategy, a core unifying strategy on how we can actually um, mainstream gender and make make gender a competitive a competitive advantage that it really was kind of naturally for us from the beginning. And so Alpha Mundi in 20, about a year ago, uh, started to work with us um, and offered a, a technical assistance opportunity actually to engage Value for Women, um, where Value for Women came in and um, uh, did you know, a comprehensive assessment of the, of our, of our, the current state of, our, of, our, of gender within our company. So that, that included everything from trying to organize across the company all the different sources of data to understand you know, customers, suppliers, both farmer suppliers as well as grain trader suppliers. Casual laborers, um, you know, where where is our business right now touching women, and what's kind of a baseline? Um, how do women employees feel working for the company as compared to, to to men employees? And that gave us then an assessment from which we went through a process of developing a commitment statement and a gender a gender and really a gender strategy. Um, and that commit that that gender strategy started with a commitment statement, where we we basically set out what's our what is our what's our belief about agriculture, what's our belief about gender. Gender equity, and really believing that that um, as we pioneer conservation agriculture, as we pioneer uh, regenerative agriculture, that that women play a really important role, uh, both as smallholder farmers as well as um, hope, uh, also decision makers within our company, um, uh, to to making sure that that's a that's really a prioritization of of how we how we operate. Um, yeah. So from strategy, we we basically within the strategy are identified really four key initiatives. The first key initiative was. Um, around the workplace um, and really identifying ways to increase retention of and increase participation of women um, in, in, in the workplace uh, for us. So, uh, you know, kind of a workforce focused, uh, focused element. The second piece of the strategy was around increasing participation of, of, uh, of women in our, in, our farmer, in our farmer base, increasing their, their access to services. So we found that we had a lot of farmer women who were supplying but weren't getting access to other services that we were, we were providing. Uh, to the farmers. Then third was um, third was around safeguarding. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a term that's used as as usual as, as regularly in the United States, but in, in where where we have where we, we operate, safeguarding really refers to uh, you know everything from anti-sexual harassment to really how the how our how our operation is interacting with the community. So as a business with large-scale farms with with uh, rural extension officers, really creating a standardized process by which. Um, sexual harassment issues and and other child and, and 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 gender protection issues could be escalated to the very top of the organization at any moment where there's an issue became not just something that we were doing from a um, uh, really became something that was central to what we were what we we're trying to do and then I think the last piece around the gender strategy and commitment was about how do we mainstream data or make make all of our data and all the data that we're capturing across the organization. Um, Integrating a gender lens in a similar way to how we're integrating an understanding of our, you know, GHG emissions, and and uh, really looking at at how how we can, you know, use that management information to 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 make better decisions around it. Um, you asked me what's work, what what works, or I think you know, recommendations I'd have for entrepreneurs and and for uh, maybe for investors. I think for investors, I would say I'd really recommend, you know, as you as you're suggesting, Lisa, or as G Search is showing, is really make the business case for it. Um, and I would say sometimes the business case can be as simple and maybe as elementary as it's going to enhance fundraising. 
which I think that you guys did a good job of, of you know, kind of initially pitching it as that. It became much more for us as we, as we went through that process. Um, and I think my, my advice for entrepreneurs would be probably less specific to gender technical assistance, but to just technical assistance in, in general. I would say that a lot of the time, at, at least how I, how I used to approach jet, a technical assistance in, say, the early stages of our company as compared to the, this Value for Women project was, um, you know, okay, we got technical assistance, now let's go give it to, you know, maybe our extension team. And now that extension team is going to develop a new, you know, a new protocol on how we're, how we're training conservation agriculture to farmers. Um, and I would just recommend for entrepreneurs that really the technical assistance is an, is an incredible resource and sometimes it's not perfect. Um, it's, it often isn't perfect and it comes with a lot of different, you know, ways you have to finagle it. But if you can really own that from the beginning um, and make it be something that's a comprehensive piece of your strategic intent, really, I think that that's going to be a lot more effective than just kind of handing a, a technical assistance budget to some fringe part of the organization that then really doesn't mainstream it within how you're, how you're managing the company. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where we are, what we, how, we've, how we've thought about gender, and we're just really now in implementation. And uh, Yeah, so. That's great. So there'll be more lessons to come. Um, well, thank you for that. And I think the last point that you made is, is a good kind of jumping off point to this question around, you know, TA or technical assistance in general. When mm. we started this project, you know, we, each of our organizations was providing this support for entrepreneurs in different ways. But we realized as we were embarking on this research that it is not a foregone conclusion that investors need to create pools of funding, often grant funding, that enables companies to tackle some of their critical business issues. And for something like a gender lens or a climate lens to something like enhancing your ability to, to tap into social impact metrics, these are things that may have sort of a public good element that may support the business, but might also support the broader goals of an investor or of this movement. And it, you know, we feel there's a strong case for TA. But to be very honest, I think while we're talking about gender lens TA, there is still a bigger conversation about TA and who should be paying for this. So I just wanted to kind of flag that because I think this is a space where we get to surface uh, sort of controversial questions. Um, the other thing that you've probably heard by now is that all of us have worked with Value for Women. Um, <laughs> they are currently at the biggest gender lens investing event, I think, of the year um, called uh, Gender Smart. It's happening in London. So for folks in the room who really want to dive deep into gender lens investing, um, that's a community to be aware of. Um, and Value for Women has been an incredible resource for all of us um, in really bridging between, again, the goals of enterprise development and gender equity in ways that have been really powerful for, for our teams. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back to this group in a minute, but for all of you and, and for folks who've joined kind of as we've been speaking, the topic of the day is how do we really embed gender equity into the businesses in our portfolio or into our own companies rather than trying to decide who's gender good and who's gender bad. Gender equity is a journey. And so we're on that journey. The companies we work with are on that journey. And what we've shared in this report are examples of how we are supporting companies to more deeply embed gender into their portfolio, into their business model. So I wanted to just turn to you for a minute if anyone has a burning question um, before we sort of come back with some comments from the panel. I just have a question around um, the TA engagements. I'm curious if um, any of you have come across any TA engagements that um, exclusively target men and boys um, around like their role in creating a gender equitable workplace or environment. Um, a lot of times TA engagements are targeted at including women or bringing more women in. Um, with, but if we don't think about what environment are we bringing them into, is it, is it really... Um, beneficial for long-term kind of systemic change. Um, so just curious about your perspective on where you see the role of, of men and boys in this gender equity process. Great, thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in quickly and then over to others. <clears throat> just anecdotally, this is kind of a, a, a fun and interesting uh, example of what you're talking about. Our head of advisory services for Mesoamerica, Mexico, Central America, um, has had a radio show for a long time around talking about with men about machismo in Mexico. And so I think that's a really important question that you ask around uh, specifically gender inclusion, that it can't exclude men, of course. And so I, uh, uh, one of the things that I think we've done a lot of work around is we have um, kind of moving beyond the traditional technical assistance, we have a program called Gender Equity Grants. 
where we say neither the lending nor the, nor, the, nor the traditional business support can address certain obstacles that face women in, um, in, their, in their journey in the business or in the farm. And um, some of them have been for their $20,000 grants that have gone toward launching a women's line of coffee and creating a, a carve out women's association within a larger cooperative. And a lot of the work is working with men and other farmers around why this is a beneficial thing for everyone to have more income for women, but that they not that there's no organ rejection. And there's, there's a lot of togetherness talking through the importance of gender inclusion so that you can leverage this important asset, which is 50% of your population and your workforce, et cetera. Um, but you know, it's, it goes back to, maybe to conclude, it goes back to being able to really um, horse whisper your way into what are really thoughtful, gender inclusive strategies to not have perverse consequences that you didn't expect um, if you're not including, for instance, very deliberately men or, and boys in the, in the conversation. Any other? Well, I mean, I think this is what we are doing by definition, right? Because we're targeting companies that were founded by men and then bringing that TA to them. And, you know, Ben, actually, the way you described your journey, it's very classic to what we've heard a lot, you know, oh, yeah, we're mindful of, of gender. And, and I had a CEO of a, one of our solar companies a couple of years ago on a panel. You know, our, like, we're 50-50 in management with like women. And then that's where it ends. You know, they're like, all right, we've hired some women and like check, we're done. But I'm sure as you can attest to now, once you go through this whole exercise and you look at you know, gender equity across the business operations in total, you know, by definition that is we are working predominantly with men at that point to then you know, build a strategy that works for everyone in the business, both men and women. And when we and when we were talking to the CEO of our solar company, you know, we were asking about the customers and who predominantly buys these, and like, you know, do you have any women on your marketing team? You know, so your marketing team, oh no, we don't really. Like, we haven't thought about that. You know, what about on your design team? Like, you know, so it's uh, when you start. I mean, how how we start and and what Ben mentioned, and we work with Value for Women, super value valuable partner. Um, they can't do everything, so I definitely think there's a need for more organizations like them, and I think there's a need for standardizing some of these uh, uh, projects or packages that we do so they can be scaled up and we can, we can talk more about scaling later. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> but bottom line, we are working with men. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it, the, the project came about to work with men because we felt that the gender lens was too focused towards, mm -hmm. you know, women and supporting just women entrepreneurs as opposed to working with men to be inclusive. Yeah, and I think one thing that is a really interesting piece of the research is that there really is a very broad array of interventions. So we didn't think like what everybody needs is this policy or everybody has to run through this training. It was actually very bottom up. And I think um, there's a piece of, of, there's a resource, I think, in addition to the final research, which was conducted at the very beginning of the process, to just look at these six impact investors and say, how do you approach this? You know, what are the tools that you're using? What are the frameworks that you use as you're thinking about providing TA? And one of the themes that came through was that we're really listening to entrepreneurs about the issues that are really material to their business and aligned with their mission. So, you know, again, when we work with an entrepreneur um, at Acumen, there's one who works in Sierra Leone and then took his model into a different country, they were really excited about the level of participation of women farmers in Sierra Leone. When they transitioned into a different country, which I can't remember, the number dropped precipitously and suddenly only like 15% of the participating farmers were women. So they said, okay, this wasn't an issue because we were seeing organically this high level of participation from women, but now it is an issue because we're in a different context. So we really have to understand what are the barriers for participation of women. Um, and that to me is sort of like, I think rather than saying we're going to target women or target men, it's to say, this is a time of learning. So let's actually work with entrepreneurs, with groups like value for women, do the innovation thing that we've all been doing for so long and learn through that. What is really working? What is really material? My question is for Ben. Ben mentioned something called safeguarding. <laughs> Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about that? And, and if you have protocols you can share with me, I would be would that be appreciated. Yeah, Thanks. super. So safeguarding is, I guess, the principle of trying to create mechanisms by which uh, inherent power structures are, uh, you know, 
can't be exploited to you know, hurt people who are vulnerable in, our, in your operation. So uh, that obviously involves the women employees that work within our company or women casual laborers who um, you know, would be uh, characterized as vulnerable working for, say, a man who's responsible for verifying if she's done her work. So how do you make sure that that woman has a, a way of uh, raising an alarm or whistleblowing or, you know, or, or raising that grievance that maybe the individual is, 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 is seeking to, to leverage, like force her into, into some kind of sexual behavior or something like that? Uh, that's kind of what I guess we all kind of immediately think about when we think about safeguarding. But then for us, it went beyond that where we have a network of rural aggregation officers that we call village transformation entrepreneurs. Um, that today are agent, agents who earn a commission as they sell inputs on our behalf and buy grain from us. Our, our kind of long-term vision is that they can become true kind of entrepreneurs, franchises to provide this service. So how do we embed within the services that they're providing, or embed within the, the, the structures that they're operating through um, ways that sexual harassment issues, uh, any exploitation can be, can be immediately escalated to to the company and be and be managed in a transparent and 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 uh, and uh, legitimate manner. And so we, we do that through our, what we call our grievance mechanism, uh, which is basically a. And I may have to cut you off because yeah, we have about time. five minutes. Sorry. Yeah. And I want to make sure we get to wrap up. But the point there is that there are going to be protocols and policies, and I don't think every startup needs to invent them. So one of the the things I yeah. think we can think about is how are we making those more widely available. So, for example, a company that's structured in a similar way in a similar context. Totally. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, going to our last comments. What are some things that you would recommend that investors do to really support this process? You know, what is the first step or uh, a starting point um, that you think investors can take away? And then likewise, for entrepreneurs in the room, um, what can they do to really partner with investors or stakeholders that are supporting them to really accompany them in this process so it doesn't feel like the entire burden of advancing gender equity sits with an early stage social enterprise, which is, just doesn't seem right to me. So any advice that you'd have for folks as they start on this journey? Yeah, I'll start uh, with both since we've done it. I think you can't start on the journey without knowing where you are. So I think the first point, you know, whether you're an investor or an entrepreneur is to sort of assess where you are. And we did that internally at Alpha Mundi as well as just looking at our portfolio companies to see like, where are we? And when we work with Value for Women, I think one of the most valuable things and the feedback we got from all of the companies we worked with, not just us, but everyone who worked with Value for Women, is they do this incredibly thorough diagnostic survey of all the employees where they really ask a lot of questions that uncover the perceptions um, of the culture of the company across operations. So, so much, like the companies told us, and, and Ben can attest this too, just how much value they even got from doing this initial survey. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is something that I think Valley Froman is making public on their website or something similar. So, you know, start with taking stock of where you are, and then as a management team, whether you're an investor or an entrepreneur, think about where you want to go and, you know, what resources you have to dedicate to this and what resources you might be able to get to support from others. I mean, we went and raised money to do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to subsidize it. But I think where we would ultimately like to see this going to is that the, the financial and social benefits of doing this work actually exceed the payment. So, you know, we believe businesses should be willing to start investing in this as a core part of their business strategy, which is kind of the first step of what this research is trying to prove. Um, but I would say, like, look at where you are and, and data. Because one of the biggest things that, you know, the challenges that we had with uh, this research was getting that secondary data, like sex desegregated. So a lot of companies are collecting, you know, basic data around their employees and their clients and whatnot, but it's not always sex desegregated. Um, so, you know, understanding where you are and then having that data, I think, are probably two of the, the most important steps. And then with that, you have the power to, mm. to shape where you want to go. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I quickly, two, uh, two pieces of advice. First would be to really look at it in a comprehensive format and not to keep on preaching for value for women here, but I would say what was so interesting about the, the way that they structure their work is it's in gender commitment, leadership and staffing, and then value chain. And I think it's really important as you approach this is to, to kind of look at it from that type of integrated perspective rather than just leadership or just value chain or just, you know, what's your gender commitment. Um, the second piece I would say is maybe as an advice to um, 
to uh, both larger larger companies that can afford it, as well as maybe smaller uh, companies and maybe to investors, is the importance of actually having someone within the organization own um, a lot of these initiatives. And so as an output of this project, we hired a, a gender youth and, and safeguarding officer um, who became a, you know, really responsible across the organization for for tracking the strategy, holding HR accountable on the leadership components, right? Holding the the agricultural side on, on other components. So, um, in small enterprises, I would imagine that that's not that's not as easy to just you know hire someone like that. Um, and so, I would say in a recommendation in the context of technical assistance. And one of the problems I think is exists in technical assistance is it's always like you hire a firm and then a firm comes and works for you. Um, and then they've got some deliverables and they leave versus, you know, seconding a resource or something that can really be within the organization to drive that forward. So, yeah, that for me would be to integrated approach and then uh, really don't underestimate, like, the resources required to actually implement whatever you're advising. I, I guess I'll, I'll make one comment on the entrepreneur side and then, I, and then a, another one on the investor side. When you describe the four buckets, the four different areas that mm. you're doing gender inclusion, gender equity in the organization, we have, it made me think a lot about, in the past year or so, we've launched something called Gender Equity Advisory Services, where it's basically saying, okay, a lot of training has happened over in business support to individual um, women actors in agriculture in our portfolio. So at the farmer level, agro-processing level, middle managers, head accountants, heads of sales, agronomists, and of course, leaders and entrepreneurs, um, uh, et cetera. But really, and I think what you've done um, with the business so, so, so well, is you need, you, you, you need to really deeply embed gender inclusion into the policies and the employment contracts and the systems and the processes and everything of the business itself. So the business itself becomes the agent for the gender inclusion versus wonderful things that individual women leaders can get more participation, more economic opportunity. But you have to do two, both of those things. So like total integration within the business as an entrepreneur is important. From an investor perspective, and I suppose this also it, uh, applies at the entrepreneur level as well, I think we think a lot about when you have a platform, as we do, certainly Acumen, Alpha Mundi, where you have, in our case, hundreds of businesses that we work with across Af Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, it, there's a lot of cross-pollination that can happen. So I feel like folks kind of call to action at a, at a community like SOCAP to be able to really, if you are developing with value for women, and uh, establishing and, and hardwiring and disseminating what you're learning through all the different businesses, how do you actually um, get that out there so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're in another part of Uganda? How do we actually create totally open book, open source um, lessons, and learn, uh, lessons learned? Lastly, about, about a year and a half ago, I think, maybe a year, we got funding from the Walmart Foundation in Central America to work together with, once again, Value for Women, to train all of the, or to provide um, workshops and training for all the members of our industry alliance called the Council on Smallholder Agriculture Finance, or CSAF, that are maybe not quite as far along in how they think about gender equity, gender inclusion. So we've had this wonderful example where we're kind of pathologically collaborating with all the peer institutions in our place, in, in, within our space, through the cross-pollination. So having the platform allows you to do that. And then, as I said, like total integration, um, deeply embedding gender inclusion, not just doing the training itself, which is important individual level, I'd say, would so I'd conclude. Yeah, I think if there's one big takeaway from this conversation is integration. Um, you know, I think none of our organizations, you'll find, have created a gender portfolio. Um, gender integration, yeah. to me, is the key. It is embedded in our strategies, whether we're investing in agriculture, energy access, it's, it's just, it's there. And one thing I would suggest for folks that are trying to pursue this question of where am I now, the 2x challenge criteria that were developed by a group of DFIs and have now extended into the private sector is a really simple framework to look at the five questions that Lisa has outlined is like, you look at ownership, you look at management, you look at employees, you look at customers, and you look at policies. And you look at where you are. The thresholds are defined within the 2x challenge criteria, which you can find on their website. Um, and they're relatively forgiving. And it's a very inclusive approach, because in order to qualify as 2x challenge uh, compliant, you need to meet one of the criteria. 
And it recognizes that people may have strengths in their business. Maybe they've said, wow, we built this amazing, very equal management team. And then you look around and say, wait a minute, all our line workers are men. Could we do better there? And so you can celebrate where you're doing well, and you can work on the places that you could do better. Um, and it also, I think, creates a huge space for conversation and dialogue about what's happening in the field. What are the patterns and the trends based on this data? Um, so again, I encourage people to take a look at that. I think you know, for Acumen, uh, this has been an incredible learning process and very humbling. Um, it's actually difficult sometimes to do these projects. So I encourage people to stay the course, not to expect immediate results. We started a lot of these TA projects um, before the pandemic and found that things were dramatically slowed and shifted. But it's this journey that we're on. And also to be willing to be transparent about what's working and what's not working. And again, I think you've seen that here today. We've just looked at our portfolio. We're 56% um, 2x challenge criteria. I'm really proud of that number. And I want to go all the way <laughs> to 100% because I don't see why not. And yeah. Acumen developed a tool that we use, yes. actually, <laughs> which they don't even use. <laughs> But it's this Acumen ICRW tool, if you just Google Acumen ICRW gender report, and it's a list of questions for entrepreneurs. It takes maybe 15 minutes to fill out, maybe. And that was like, before we did the longer intensive studies with Value for Women, that was our door opener. And we still give this to all our companies at the diligence stage. Wow. Just like, so when <laughs> we're doing diligence, we you know, kind of get a sense of where they are. And, you know, we're not going to say, oh, as Alpha Mundi, we're not going to invest in you if you don't have X percent as women. Mm. But we would say, if you're not even open to having these conversations with us, we're probably not the right yeah. investor for you. Yeah. So that's really the criteria, you know, take the survey, like, look at it, look at the results, kind of see where you stand. And if you're willing to just even have these conversations with us and start to think about this, then you know, we can we can partner with you on it, can, but can it's I, a good tool. Yeah. One quick build, ICRW is the International Center for Research on Women, and I just want to put in a plug for them. Our former board member, Peggy Clark, who was with Aspen Institute for many years, runs the ICRW now, and at CGI, Clinton Global Initiative, a couple of weeks, three weeks ago, they made a big global commitment. This is maybe a teaser for the next panel that we have, <laughs> which is about saying there's a lot of anecdote, but there's very little data, very concrete data and deep research on the nexus uh, of women in climate. <coughs> so it feels like all of this work we're talking about is preparing for that conversation about how do we actually, with lots of data, inform transformative um, you know, action around women and climate action. Yeah, and there is cool. a fantastic report on the nexus of gender and climate that was published by Gender Smart. Yep. So the tools are out there. <laughs> no There's excuses. a QR code on the back of this, yeah. too, which has, I mean, we have a lot of deliverables. Every one of the six uh, consortium members of G-Search has a two to three pager on how they're doing this. So yeah. if you want examples of how other investors are doing it, there's two to three pagers from six investors on how they're doing it, what they're applying. Um, there's tools, there's data, there's criteria. So there's a lot of uh, products online. And don't, don't be daunted. Just start. Yep. Um, and <laughs> certainly feel free to reach out to any of us if you are kind of looking for a little support on that journey because I think this is, we did this search effort for this movement. Um, and so really excited that you guys took the time to be here today. Thank you so much.